Um, today we are talking about birthplace of empires. Now let me say, today I promise you, you're going to be overwhelmed. <laughs> it's a guarantee. You are going to be overwhelmed. Uh, if you new? think I've given you, what's that? This is something new. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, if you think you've been overwhelmed so far, then trust me. Now, this, um, I'm going, because we're talking about the various empires that have been part of the ancient Near East, part of the Eastern Mediterranean where we're visiting, there have been a lot of them. And I'm, I'm only going to hit the, the, the big ones, you know, the high points. There are a lot of tiny ones we're not even going to mention because that's not possible. But even so, I'm going to give you a lot of information and I have to use dates. I can't tell you the history of things without having dates. I do not expect you to remember them. If you try to remember everything I'm about to tell you, your head will explode. I've seen it happen. So, so the point here is this, this is, you're on vacation. You're not supposed to be working at this. So I'm telling you this for general interest. Just let it wash over you. If something sticks, if there is a particular piece of information or a date that, that you go, oh, I always wondered how those two things fit together, then that's great if you take something away from it. But it's just for your interest. We're not doing this because we expect you to take a test afterwards. So understand halfway through this when you're going, oh my gosh, George, what do I do with all this? That's okay. Just let it flow. Okay? Not a problem. Um, I've talked already about ancient Mesopotamia, where civilization, um, as best we know, pretty much began about 3000 BC, which is 5,000 years ago. They began building cities in this part of the world. And they did so because of the rivers, Tigris and Euphrates. This was a fertile floodplain of this, these two rivers and, and the tributaries. And because of that, this is the place where people first settled down from being nomadic uh, hunters gatherers. They were able to plant crops because they found some kinds of grains that grew wild and they began to domesticate them. They domesticated animals and various other kinds of things. So this is where, as best we can tell, civilization started. There's some argument that the Indus River Valley in Pakistan and India may have been about the same time, but they only discovered that, you know, a few decades ago. They really don't know a lot about that yet. Now, one of the things you will notice is up here, there are mountains. The Taurus, the Caucasus, and the Zagros Mountains. Down here, there is a desert. But other than that, there are no natural barriers in this region. Uh, from the Mediterranean Sea to the Persian Gulf, and even if you come from Iran, what's called the Iranian Plateau, um, there are passes through that that people would, it was very easy to move into this area. And as more and more different kinds of people looked at the early uh, Sumerian civilizations, the first cities, that they had crops and animals and they were doing really well, various people said, that looks really good. Let's go take over this land. And because there weren't a lot of natural barriers, this was a, there was one empire after another that came in and took over this area in Mesopotamia. Um, Ur, here, the city of Ur, um, Abraham came from, the Ur, from Ur of the Chaldees, which means that's where Abraham came from. This is also the site of both Uruk and Eridu are potential candidates for the oldest cities in the world. As I said before, some say Jericho, some say Damascus or Aleppo in Syria, some say uh, Shat al-Hayek in, um, in Turkey, modern-day Turkey. So we don't know for sure, but we know that in terms of multiple cities, kind of early civilization, this is where it started. The people here invented writing. Their early writing, like this, was pictographic, meaning they had little pictures similar to hieroglyphics. It, you, know, you know hieroglyphics from Egypt. Pictographic writing has little images that represent things. Later on, they went to um, a cuneiform, which is Latin, literally the, the Latin word cuneiform means wedge-shaped. And they moved from pictographic to symbolic, uh, a, a, where they were representing sounds, the sounds of the words. Um, this is the place where this picture down here, which is from ancient Mesopotamia, they invented the wheel they domesticated animals, and they developed what we take for granted as being sort of a, a, a family structure. Um, there have been various other, when we, when we talk about Sparta later, you'll find out that there hasn't always been a consistent idea about mom and dad and two kids, you know, and the dog. The, 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 but the Sumerians had a family structure that we would have recognized. And in this middle, you'll notice these two emblems up here. They were the emblems for the sun and the moon. 
two of the major uh, natural phenomena that they deified. And I've shown you this already. This is believed to be perhaps the oldest human artifact ever from like 20, 22 to 24,000 BC. Um, and it, it is the Earth Mother, the mother goddess of fertility. So they were, all of these things began developing in Mesopotamia. They also, as I said, built cities. The early cities were all made out of mud. The reason was the only thing that existed there was mud. They did not have any stone. They didn't build anything out of stone. And they would build cities. Usually in the center of their cities, there was a walled area like a fortress, and it served several purposes. In times of being attacked, which happened a lot in Mesopotamia, the people could gather inside the wall part of the city, and that was usually the place where both the king and the priests of their religion lived. The kings were seen as not only political but as religious figures. They were God's representative to rule the people. Um, and usually there was a temple inside these cities. The early temples were called ziggurats, which means a stepped pyramid, like that, okay? Um, and we know for a fact that's what they were like because that's a real one from uh, about 2000 BC. It is the zig great ziggurat of Ur. It was covered with sand. They uncovered it and cleaned it up, but that's the real thing. I have pictures of that where there were airplanes flying behind it. The, the Allied troops when, you know, during the, uh, the Iraqi war, pictures of them walking up those steps. But except for cleaning it up, that is the same Great Pyramid of Earth. So we know exactly what they look like. Now, one of the things that would be interesting, they built cities. Do you notice anything about these houses around the city? Square. Anything particular? They're around the courtyard. There are no streets. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, a number of the most ancient cities they've discovered, the houses were built right next to each other. The reason they have house, the, the holes in the middle is the way they got in and out was by climbing up ladders. And if you wanted to go, uh, you know, if you wanted to leave your house and go to your friend's house, which was five houses over, you climbed up the ladder and walked across the roofs of the people in between. There were no streets. Um, whoever invented streets, I'm sure, became very popular. Um, but at that time, this is what the cities looked like. Um, so from Mesopotamia, the other civilization that developed at much the same time was ancient Greece. The, um, or ancient Egypt. <laughs> it is different. We'll talk about Greece in a minute. Ancient Egypt. The belief is that sometime around 3200 to 3100 BC, a man named Menes, according to later historians, uh, joined the upper and lower parts of Egypt into one kingdom. Now, when you look at this, this is Upper Egypt, this is Lower Egypt. Okay, this, the, what you see as the southern is upper because it's, the river flows north, and so that's the upper part of the river. Um, each of these little towns that you see along here previously, they were called gnomes, like the city in Alaska, gnome. And the people who, each of them had their own rulers, like, like a mayor, and they were called nomarchs. Sort of like monarch spelled sideways, nomark. <laughs> and so the nomarchs were independent until Minis comes along around 3200-3100 and he joins all of the nomarchs in the, in the upper Nile and all the nomarchs in the southern Nile into the first kingdom. And uh, one of the things is each of the kingdoms, the northern and southern, whoever was kind of in charge of those areas had a different crown. The white one that you see here was the crown of the upper Nile region. The red crown was the crown of the southern Nile. So when Minis combined these two, the crown looks like this. There, it's a double crown. And you will see other images, or photo, not photographs, but you'll see other images <laughs> of the Egyptian pharaohs wearing a crown like that, in addition to the headdress with the cobra on it. But the two crowns represented the combination of upper and lower Egypt. In fact, the pharaohs, one of their titles was the, the king of the two lands, combining the two of them. Now, the, Egypt had three main time periods. The Old Kingdom was from about 2650 BC to about 2150, about 500 years. And then they had an intermediate period. Then the Middle Kingdom and an intermediate period. And then the, the New Kingdom. And in each case, those kingdoms ended because the pharaohs overextended themselves financially. 
and in various other ways. And so they would lose power for a while and it was a time of chaos. But for the most part, Egypt has the longest historical or the longest historical record of a civilization anywhere. Technically, it's not an empire because uh, when we think about Egypt, it's one country, right? I mean, they combined it, but an empire typically means somebody went out and conquered other places and combined them all together. Now, Egypt did conquer some other places in the New Kingdom. The Old Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom, Egypt pretty much stayed to themselves. And for the most part, people didn't bother them. Why did they stay to themselves and not get bothered? You'll remember I showed you Mesopotamia didn't have any natural barriers. Well, Egypt has got the Sahara Desert on the west and the south. It's got the Red Sea on the east and beyond there, the Arabian Desert. About the only way anybody could get to them was from the Mediterranean Sea in the north. And for the most part, navies, um, Egypt invented the ships. You know, the first ships we know anything about in terms of more than just sort of a, a, a bunch of bulrushes, somebody's riding around in the water. Um, Egypt invented ships, and so there was nobody that could really attack them because they were protected pretty much on all sides. That's why Egypt has this enormously long history as one culture, with a couple of minor interruptions, but still, Egypt becomes the historical timeline that we compare everybody else to, to know when other things happen. They invented not only ships, but they invented stone quarrying, because they did have stones. They invented quarrying, they invented surveying, and the construction techniques that allowed for these massive monuments. The ziggurats in Mesopotamia were just bricks, mud bricks, that got stacked on top of each other. These ended up as massive monuments. They created a system of mathematics that, uh, that contributed to later <laughs> systems. A, a refined medicine, they perfected um, irrigation, although irrigation had occurred previously in Mesopotamia. They sort of perfected it. And the very first known peace treaty ever was Egyptian, between Egypt and the Hittites, which I'll talk about in a minute. So um, Egypt is a very rich culture. Now, when you saw some of the images of the gods and whatnot from Mesopotamia, very primitive, right? Very sophisticated in Egypt, partly because their culture lasted so long they had time to refine everything. Uh, the, the thing you think of as being sort of the symbol of Egypt, that is the pyramids, uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza and the other pyramids, and the Sphinx, that was from the Old Kingdom. And they're a little rougher. Right? If you think about it, they're spectacular, but they're not as refined. The images of Tutankhamun and the Valley of the Kings and some of the other things, those were from the New Kingdom, where the, over a period of time, the art, uh, the, even the theology, their beliefs, the polytheistic beliefs, became much more refined. The last of the Egyptian uh, pharaohs of any significance was Ramses III. He died in 1070 BC. So think about it. You know, Menes combined them into one country in 3200 BC, and it was, you know, uh, not till 1070 BC that the last of the major pharaohs, Ramses III, died. And after that period of time, Egypt went into a slow decline. They were conquered by the Kushites, which is an African people from the south, uh, by Assyrians, by the Persians, by Alexander in 332 BC, and from that point on, they were never a, gr a great kingdom again. But still, their history was so long, um, very significant. Perhaps the first empire ever in history was the empire of the Akkadians. Um, the Akkadians, and, and you recognize this, right? Where did everybody want to go? Because they had lots of water and lots of fertile land, and it was flat. They wanted the Mesopotamia Valley. Well, the Akkadian Empire was started by a guy named Sargon. Sargon the Great, and that name Sargon gets repeated later because this guy represented the first great empire builder. Um, this empire started about 2350 BC, and it was destroyed about 2150. It only lasted about 200 years because as often happened, Sargon, very ambitious, great conqueror, great, great empire builder, his sons not so much, and his grandsons even less, so it only lasted about 200 years. But the Akkadian Empire was very significant, and Sargon, during his life, started out in the city of Akkad. That's where Akkadian Empire comes from. And from Akkad, he first conquered the cities around him, south, but he then struck out and went toward the Mediterranean Sea, up toward the mountains uh, of the, the Zagros Mountains, all the way down into Semitic er the more Semitic areas in the south, so he was a very significant conqueror. 
Most of the images that you'll get, this is Sargon again on the left, um, are military ones. From this point on, almost all of the empires would have very military images because they became empires by conquering other people. And so you get images like this. Now, um, the first cavalry was not Hittite, or not Akkadian. It came later. But you'll, they did use horses, not organized as cavalry, cavalry units. Most of the ancient uh, warriors, um, actually up until the Greeks, the way they did battle is they would all get all of their soldiers lined up in a row and they would scream really, really loud and they would rush at the other guys. And whoever screamed loudest and rushed fastest and had the sharpest weapons, they would um, they'd win the battle. Well, the Hittites created uh, the mounted uh, soldiers, although they didn't have an organized cavalry, but it must have been very difficult. All right? Do you notice anything about this, so this uh, guy on a horse? Stirrups. No stirrups. Can you imagine riding a horse into battle and shooting a bow with no stirrups? Stirrups were a very important invention when it came to uh, mounted military efforts. And when we talk about uh, Philip of Macedon and his son Al, Alexander the Great, stirrups come into the play very much so. I love the fact, you'll notice down here, this is another image of Sargon. There are quite a few images where you'll see him holding a lion as though it were a kitten. All right? This is a lion, claws and everything, and the whole image was he was so tough, he would cuddle with lions. All right? Not mind it. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, propaganda through the various images they have. Well, while the Akkadian Empire was there, other powers were beginning to sort of develop, and a people called the Amorites, those of you who are Old Testament uh, readers, the Amorites are mentioned in, in the Old Testament. They were a Semitic people from down around what we know of it as Israel. They moved north. And when the Akkadian Empire declined under Sargon's son and sons and grandsons, they took over this region. Look familiar? Everybody, most of the empires were either entirely or at least based on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. That was where it was fertile and it was flat. So the old Babylonian, now it's important you understand there were two Babylonian periods, old Babylonian and new Babylonian or neo-Babylonian. This, this period started around 1894 uh, BC, and the figure, a person you may have heard of, who was the main, the guy who made this work, was Hammurabi. You ever heard of Hammurabi? You may have heard, bless you, you may have heard of the code of Hammurabi. Hammurabi was the man who came up with, the, at least as far as we know, the first written set of laws called the Code of Hammurabi. And it included punishments. Most of the punishments for breaking laws were that they killed you. I mean, that was usually the thing they did. But there was also, um, it was very fair in many ways because it protected the, the rights of women and children and, you know, the weak. It, it actually was quite sophisticated for its time, which was like 4,000 years ago. And so Hammurabi, and this is an image of him, um, was very significant. It's believed by many that he may be the king called um, uh, Aruafel, who is in the 14th chapter of the book of Genesis, um, because he talks about the king of Shinar, and Shinar was what they called Sumeria in the Old Testament, uh, or the Hebrew Bible. Forgive me for calling it Old Testament. I've been calling it that for a long, long time. The Tower of Babel story, which is the 11th chapter of the book of Genesis, it's believed that may have been during the time of Hammurabi, as this great empire was growing. The idea of the Tower of Babel was that the people became so proud of themselves, they were going to build a tower, and it probably was a, you know, a spiral ziggurat that would reach to the heavens. And that, again, according to the book of Genesis, God recognized that if these people put their mind to it, there's nothing they can't do. So he comes down and, and, and causes, uh, confuses their language so that there are many different languages. And this is a historic image of the Tower of Babel. It is not actually photographed. Um, <laughs> how many times am I going to tell that joke? All right. Now I'm going to jump east a little bit, uh, or west, excuse me, to two of the ancient Grecian or pre-Grecian civilizations. I'm not going to talk about these a lot because I'm going to talk about them tomorrow. The first one, which was the first civilization that we know of in all of Europe. Civilization means cities. Right? It means staying in one place. That is the Minoan civilization that was founded in ancient 
uh, Crete, which we will visit in two days. The origins of the Cretan or Minoan civilization was around 3000 BC. Their height, when they were uh, most powerful, was, as it says here, 1700 to 1450 BC. They were not military. They, were, they did not conquer people. They were trading people, and they planted a number of different uh, colony outposts throughout the Aegean and along the coast of what we know as Turkey, but they were, um, you know, they didn't conquer anybody. Uh, we didn't even know about the Minoan civilization. Now, the, the, the Greek uh, myths include stories about this island people and the, that big emphasis on bulls, which it turns out the bulls were sacred to the Minoans. We didn't even know that until the 1900s. Um, a guy named Arthur Evans went to the island of Crete and decided, I think there's something to these myths from Greece, and he started poking around and digging some, and he found the Minoan civilization. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, the other civilization, which I'm also going to discuss because it's in between the Minoan and the Greek, and tomorrow we're going to talk about the mysteries of, Minoan, uh, of the Minoans and the unlikely rise of Greece, is the Mycenaean civilization. The Mycenaean civilization was on the mainland. This area right here, this peninsula, is called the, the Peloponnesian Peninsula. It is part of Greece. The city of Mycenae, right there, which again I'll tell you more about tomorrow, um, founded a civilization, and they were military. They were militant. In fact, they conquered uh, the Minoan civilization in Crete, uh, which is sort of the reason the Crete civil, Cretan civilization ended, the Minoan civilization, is because um, the island of Thera, any of you all been to Santorini? Has anybody been to Santorini? What is the thing you notice when you sail into Santorini? This giant crater. Because around 1500 BC, the, the island of Thera, now called Santorini, blew up. It was a volcano. We believe that's the primary thing that ended the Minoan civilization. Because the, the island of Santorini or Thera is right here. Okay, very close. So, the Mycenaean civilization was involved in the legend of Troy. They were one of the, one of the city-states. Back then, there wasn't a country of Greece. They were all city-states. Every city was its own nation. Um, they were involved in assaulting Troy and the Trojan War. And I'm going to talk about that more tomorrow. But the Mycenaean uh, civilization also was very sophisticated. The cities that they have there, and once again, we didn't even know it existed for sure until the 1900s. And now uh, they've excavated. I'll show you some pictures tomorrow, okay? Next, I want to go back to Asia Minor and Mesopotamia for one of the most powerful <coughs> warrior peoples that ever came along, and that is the, the Hittites and the Hittite Empire. Originally, the people who made up the Hittite Empire came from up here. Okay, from north of the Black Sea, and they thought, man, it's cold here. So they're going to head to the Mediterranean, and they did sometime around 3000 BC. They come down, they start this, um, during the Bronze Age, they start this empire, and the empire lasted for over a thousand years, from uh, when it once again established, from about 2000 to 1000 BC. They peaked between about 1450 and 1200. Their capital was in Hattusas. This is Turkey, as we know it. It was called Anatolia in the ancient times. Later on, the, the Romans renamed it Asia Minor. But from uh, Hattusha, they created a significant empire. Um, they were particularly important because they used, they were the first ones to use iron weapons and iron tools extensively. Others had a little bit of iron, but in terms of iron weapons, they were so effective because no, everybody else was still using bronze. Okay, a bronze sword against a, an iron sword, who's going to win, right? Um, the king that really brought them to fame was named, uh, I, I struggle with this, Supeluliamas. Supeluliamas, great name for a king. One of the coolest names up until the Assyrians. The Assyrians had really cool names like Tiglath Pileser III. But Supeluliamas is a pretty cool name too. So um, at the time when they came into prominence, the only other empire that had, or country that had any competition for them were the Egyptians. The um, Hittites were especially famous because while they didn't invent them, they were the ones that really made the chariot an effective war tool. And because they were made out of iron, very powerful. Most of the Hittite images you see will involve chariots because that, they were the tanks of the ancient world. And so that's what allowed them, well, 
Egypt also developed chariot technology, and so one of the great battles of ancient times in 1300 BC was the Battle of Kadesh. The Battle of Kadesh, which is in Syria, was the largest chariot battle ever. I mean, it's like a major tank battle in the Second World War between the Hittites and the Egyptians. Nobody won. It was a draw, but it was so devastating to both armies that both the Hittites and the Egyptians went into a period of decline militarily because they almost wiped each other out. This is the Hittite Empire. As you can see, it was pretty substantial in its heyday. Again, Asia Minor, this is Mesopotamia here. Um, the, what we know as Canaan or Palestine or Israel and then Egypt down here. Um, so the Hittite Empire brought iron into the world. Um, one of the things during the Hittite Empire is that was the period during Hittite power when both the Phoenicians and the nation of Israel under David and Solomon came along. Now, interesting thing about the Hittites, they're mentioned in the Bible several times. We had no, again, no archeological evidence of them. And in the late 1800s, the various historians would say, well, it's unlikely the Hittites ever really existed. And if they did really exist, they were never substantial. Well, what do you think? Were they substantial? In 1906, they found over 10,000 cuneiform tablets this wedge-shaped writing because they had adopted wedge-shaped writing, the cuneiform, from, from Mesopotamia when they conquered it, uh, or part of it. And so we found over 10,000 cuneiform tablets. We found out all about the Hittites and their significance. And then later they also found various documents in Egypt identifying the Hittites as a major competitor. And as I say, the first peace treaty in history was between Egypt and the Hittites. Well, right in between Egypt and the Hittites, you've got... Uh, Israel. In fact, one I read one historian in the late 1900s who said, well, if the Hittites ever did exist, and we doubt it, they were never as significant as uh, the Kingdom of Israel during that time. Well, they were. Um, Israel, while they... Israel uniquely had a period of time in which Egypt and the Hittites, remember I told you that they had sort of worn each other out? It was a period of astonishing peace, which is one of the reasons why the nation of Israel, under David and Solomon especially, was able to grow as much as they did, because most of the other major world powers were kind of in recession at that point. It's also the time when the Phoenicians come along. There never was a country called Phoenicia. Phoenicia, or the Phoenicians, is just a word we use to make it convenient to talk about them. They were city-states, which was the had been the way that, that governments worked. It was cities, the cities of Tyre, of Sidon, of... Diblos especially, right along this northern area, that's the purple. And we, conveniently, in order to talk about them together, because they, they were trading nations, we talk about them as the Phoenicians. They were very significant. Tyre planted a colony in North Africa, which was called Carthage. You heard of Carthage? Later on, the Carthaginians would give fits. They and their, their famous general Hannibal would give fits to the Romans. In fact, the Romans, after three wars, the Punic Wars with the Carthaginians, just barely squeaked it out, mostly because they were like a, a fighter who wouldn't, wouldn't actually come to blows. They kept dancing around, and Hannibal kept wandering up and down the Italian peninsula trying to get somebody to fight him and finally got tired and didn't have any supplies left, so he went back to Carthage. But um, the, the Carthaginians were planted. They were a colony of Tyre, which was a Phoenician city. Now, the next and one of the most significant empires... Um, is your head exploded yet? No. Okay, you doing all right? Do you need to take a break? Bathroom break? Some water? Okay. Yeah, there's a lot here, I told you. But again, if just a little bit of this, you get a hook, and you go, so that's what that was. Then you're okay. The Assyrian Empire was one of the most significant ever in terms of their military capabilities. The Assyrians were, had been a tiny kingdom for a long time. When they were a tiny kingdom, and this Assyria would be in the, the area we know as northern Iraq, um, they had, again, everybody's wanted to invade this area, and so when they were a tiny kingdom around the city of Asher, then they had people trying to conquer them from the south, people from the north, and they had to keep fighting these people, and they became very fierce warriors and very tough. In fact, they not only became tough and fierce, they became cruel. The Assyrians for, were renowned for their cruelty. The, the Assyrian king that really brought them to fame named himself Sargon II. Why? Because the first great empire had been the Akkadian Empire founded by Sargon. So the Assyrian king, and again, there are two periods in the Assyrian uh, empire history. 
The first one is represented by this darker green area. And, you know, what is that? That's the Mesopotamian River system. Everybody wanted that. That happened about in the 800s BC, and they really came to power, and then they went away for a while, or, or you know, and then came back in the 600s. Um, when they came back in the 600s, their empire was much larger. They took over all of Egypt, um, you know, and that's, that's after Egypt's decline, where they were no longer powerful. Now, I said that the Assyrians were cruel. These are some images, relief images, from um, walls in Assyria. This one, you'll notice they're carrying off booty from having conquered places. This, they're flaying people that were captured. Flaying means they're peeling their skin off. This image, they're piling up severed heads. Now, and the Assyrians figure the best way we can we can defeat people is when we when we conquer a city, let's crucify people, let's impale them on stakes, let's cut off their heads, let's peel off their skins and hang it on the walls. They were a cruel bunch of folks. This image is again people being taken off into slavery, uh, goods being carted off. This is the um, the King Jehu from Israel kneeling down before the Assyrian king, Ashurbanipal. In 720 BC, the Assyrian Empire, by this time uh, the, the nation of Israel has been split in two. The southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom, which very confusedly is called Israel. Northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom, which had they had never been obedient to God, according to, according to the uh, Hebrew Bible, as judgment against them, they never had a good king, they worshipped idols like crazy, um, they were defeated, destroyed by the Assyrians in 722 BC, and they were carried off into captivity. Now, um, this brings us to the legend of the ten lost tribes of Israel. By the way, your eyes are not out of focus. This image was out of focus when I, when I copied it. Um, the northern part of the two kingdoms of Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, ten of the tribes of Israel lived in the north. The southern uh, kingdom, and remember there were twelve tribes of Israel from the twelve sons of Jacob. Actually, the Levites weren't counted in that, and Joseph got two shares, two of his sons. Ephraim and Manasseh, okay, but 10 of the tribes, roughly speaking, lived in the north. They were defeated, conquered, carried off into captivity. This led, and, and the, the Assyrians, whenever they conquered a people, they carried them off into captivity, they forced them to intermarry with other people, so the people were half-breeds. Half in fact, during the time of Jesus in the New Testament, the Samaritans, the whole thing about the Samaritans and why nobody got along with the Samaritans is because they were seen as half-breeds. They were half-Jewish and half-something else. And the, their religion was not pure Judaism anymore. That's because the Assyrians. Well, the ten tribes in the north were carried off into captivity and became known as the ten lost tribes of Israel. That's where that comes from. The two tribes in the south, uh, Judah and Benjamin, plus some of the, the tribe of Simeon and some of the Levites, there were others, they continued um, in the south, Judea. That's where the word Jew comes from, is from the southern kingdom of Judea. And later on, they were conquered by the Babylonians. But anyway, the, the tribes, there are various peoples throughout the world who claim to be descended from those ten lost tribes. In India, southern India, there's a group of Jews called the Bnei Ephraim who claim that they are descended from the tribe of Ephraim. Um, there's the Bnei Menashe in northeast India that claim to be descended from the, the tribe of Manasseh. And you'll notice, this is getting over toward India here. Um, and various others. The Ethiopian Jews claim to be descended from Dan. Persian Jews claim to be descended from Ephraim. In Nigeria, there are groups that claim to be descended from several of them. If all of those claims are true, and a few of them have been tested genetically, I mean, you know, biologically, genetically, and identified that, yes, they do have Semitic ancestry. Um, if all of those are true, then the only tribes that really got completely lost were the tribes of Issachar, Asher, and Naphtali. All right? So... This is the, the whole history, the, the mythology, the legend of the ten lost tribes of Israel. The southern kingdom, and I, and I meant to point out to you something. You will notice in all of this map, there's one area that's not green. Do you see it? Yeah. This is not. See that? It's yellow. It's kind of hard to tell it's yellow on this projection. That's Judah. That's the southern kingdom of Israel called the kingdom of Judah. After 
conquering the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 and destroying it. The Assyrians come south and they plant themselves outside the city of Jerusalem and are, are threatening to destroy the southern kingdom of Judah as well. That's during the time of King Hezekiah, one of the good kings of the southern kingdom, and of, I, of um, Isaiah the prophet. And Isaiah tells King Hezekiah, do not give up because they will not conquer you. And Hezekiah is not sure what to do, you know. And so it says the Assyrian army's there. And if you read it in, in the uh, King James, it, it pretty much says, and the Assyrian army uh, woke up the next morning to find themselves dead. Because apparently the historians say there was a plague. And tens of thousands of Assyrians fell ill and died. And so um, the Ashurbanipal picked up the rest of his army and went back to Nineveh. At that point, their capital was in Nineveh. Nineveh, by the way, is the place that Jonah went to when he got swallowed by the big fish. He was going to Nineveh, to the Ninevites, which are the Assyrians. Well, that's... So the, Judah was the only part of this whole region that did not get conquered by the Assyrians because Isaiah the prophet told Hezekiah, if you'll hold out, you'll be fine, and they were. So there you have it. Um, now, the, the power of the Assyrians finally fell to... The Neo-Babylonians. I told you there were two Babylonian periods. The first one, Hammurabi, is the name to remember. The second one, the Neo-Babylonians, a guy named Napopolazar comes along, and he reestablishes control. He sort of uh, fends off the Assyrians. But his son is the one that you probably heard of, whose name is Nebuchadnezzar. <coughs> Nebuchadnezzar was the great king of the second or Neo-Babylonian period in the 600s. He rebuilt the city of Babylon. He built a huge temple to Marduk, which was the, the Mesopotamian god that they, they worshipped. The city of Babylon, give you an idea, it was a huge city with huge gates surrounded by, you know, by, right by the river. Um, and it's estimated somewhere between 10 and 50,000 people, depending upon who you ask, lived in the city. Now again, this is a city that's 2,600 years ago. Um, and so a huge city. This is a photograph of the gate of Ishtar, which was one of the gates into the city. They, would, they figured out a way to glaze the bricks. And so if you go to the Pergamum Museum in Berlin, you'll see that. Because they took it to Berlin. Most of the really cool stuff from the ancient Near East is in Western Europe. You know, Berlin... The British, oh, they're terrible, you know, for taking stuff. Um, and and so the Perga, they re took it apart, took it back to Berlin, and rebuilt it inside. You know, there, there are fluorescent lights up here. This is uh, <laughs> indoors, and this is what it looks like. This is what some of the various panels look like. It was in Babylonia, in the Neo-Babylonian period, that they also created the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So... Um, Whereas the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel in 722, the southern kingdom was better. They had better kings that really tried to uh, follow God, you know, kings like Josiah and Hezekiah and others. They had some bad ones too. But finally, um, enough was enough, and the southern kingdom of Judah was destroyed by the Babylonians by King Nebuchadnezzar in 586 B.C. There actually was a period of time from from 600 to 586, where they had defeated the, uh, the Israelites, taken some of them off into captivity, but they finally destroyed the city of Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. That's the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586. This was the Temple of Solomon. They carried them off into captivity, but unlike the Assyrians, the Babylonians don't, don't take them any further than, than Babylon. They don't force them to intermarry, and the Jews were able to maintain much of their identity. Well, after uh, only about 50 years, the Babylonian Empire fell to the Persians. King Cyrus the Great comes along, and when Cyrus had a very different idea from the Assyrians and Babylonians, the Persian King Cyrus the Great said, I don't want people fighting back once I conquer them, so I'm going to be nice to them. Duh! New idea. He told the various peoples he conquered that if they were in captivity somewhere away from their homeland, they could go home. He told the Jews, you can go back to Israel. You can go back to uh, Jerusalem. Um, this, Persia was the largest empire up to that date. The king, as I said, was Cyrus the Great. That's him in the upper right. 
you get a lot of reliefs of you know these winged uh, chimeras that the beautiful carvings and things. If you go to the British Museum in London, you will see giant statues that look like that because the British nicked them and took them back to London. Okay, um, they were very effective as military as well. The Persian sh uh, soldiers. Very powerful. I, I call it the Persian Empire. If you ever read something about the Achaemenian, <coughs> Achaemenian is the technical word for it because that was the people, the, the group that started it, the Achaemenians. Um, so the Achaemenians come along, they create this great empire, and uh, there's a, you see this line? This is Susa, which was the capital of the Persian Empire, going all the way to Ephesus. They built a road over 1,500 miles long. This was part of the Silk Road the way in which they communicated from the east with spices and silk and all that kind of thing to the west was the road the Persians had originally built. Um, there was a... I'm going to talk tomorrow about the conflict between the Persians and the Greeks because there was a big conflict and particularly because you will notice all of Asia Minor, whoops, wrong button, all of Asia Minor, what we know of as Turkey, was controlled by Persia. Greece is right here. But when we look at a map of Greece, there are along the coast, even though this belonged to Persia, the cities there were, were Greek. They thought of themselves as Greek. They spoke Greek. Why? Because when the Greeks conquered Troy, which is right here, these, they also conquered the coast. Around 500 BC, they rebelled against Persia and said, we don't want to have anything to do with you anymore. In fact, it started at Ephesus. In 498, there was the Battle of Ephesus. The Greeks come, um, come over and they decide that we're going to put these people in their place. And they start a war with Greece, the Persian Wars. And I'm going to talk about all that tomorrow. Okay, uh, So we'll get into that. And then, of course, we have Alexander the Great. In the 300s, Alexander the Great, he was not Greek. Alexander the Great, his father Philip II, who is this person, Philip II was probably the most underrated person in history. He got assassinated fairly early. He created the army, he created the motivation that his son Alexander picked up to conquer most of the known world. But in Macedon, or Macedonia, it's called either one, north of what we know as Greece, they didn't even speak Greek there. They spoke Macedonian. There were several languages, Macedonian, Thracian, Illyrian, various small countries there, and yet they valued the Greek culture. And in fact, Philip had Aristotle, the Aristotle philosopher, come and spend uh, three years as his son Alexander's tutor. And so they valued the whole Greek culture, and later on, when Alexander, the Macedonian, conquered the known world, he took the Greek culture with him, because they valued it, even though the original language of, was Macedonian. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Apparently, he really did look like that. There are several statues of him um, that all look very similar. Um, and they say that he was loved by both men and women. Apparently, he was a handsome guy, which never hurts when you're trying to conquer the world. Um, <laughs> this was what Philip, uh, or what Alexander's empire looked like. Conquered all of Greece, Thrace, Macedonia, of course, crossed over, conquered all of what had been the Persian Empire, and all the way over to the Indus River Valley, over into India. And as I said, and we'll talk about later this afternoon, we'll do, we're talking about Alexander the Great. He wanted to go all the way to the Great Sea over here, but after just over 10 years, the whole thing was 11 years, after 10 years, his, his, so, his officers, his soldiers said, Al, can we not go home? and take advantage of some of this stuff we've gathered up, you know, all this money we've made, so we want to we want to end it, and so they headed back. After Alexander died, a period called the Hellenistic period, which we'll get into detail this afternoon, his he left no successor, he had no heir. The, the story is that on his deathbed, his generals are gathered around him and they say, Alexander, you know, who do you want to be your heir? And again, the legend is, he said, to the strongest. Well, that meant war. And so when he died, they had what's called the War of the Diadochi. Diadochi is Greek for successor. And so his generals fought it out. They ended up with five of the generals uh, left standing. Two of them were not that significant. Uh, whoops. Oh, keep pushing the wrong button. Sorry. Parthians, Romans. 
Cassander and Lysimachus got part of Greece and Macedonia. But the three main ones were Ptolemy, who took all of Egypt, which was the prize because of the uh, long culture and wealth and everything else. And you'll hear about the Ptolemaic Empire of Greece. Well, it was actually a Macedonian who started all that. And one of his descendants was Cleopatra. Um, Seleucus, who had actually had been a minor general, but ended up being successful in the War of the Diadochi of the successors, took all of Asia Minor over into, or I'm sorry, all of uh, the Mesopotamia over into India. And then you had an Antigonus, Antigonus Monophthalmus, because he only had one eye, Monophthalmus, one eye. Um, so Antigonus took it. They fought it out. Later on, it, it got simplified from there. Then the Romans come along. Uh, I'm, Rome is not, or the Roman Empire did not start in ancient Near East, but obviously it affected the ancient Near East. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how the Hellenistic period ended when Rome came in and took over everything. The thing that you need to remember about Rome, uh, the Roman Empire, is that it wasn't always an empire. There were three distinct periods in Roman history. The first period was the period of the monarchs. They had kings. Rome was founded 753 BC, just think 750. And for the first 250 years, they had kings. Some of them were Etruscan kings. The last king, who had a name that was worthy of the Assyrians, um, was Tarquinus Superbus. <laughs> I think I'm going to name myself Rossus Superbus. Um, he raped, the legend says, he raped a noblewoman. He was the king. He could do whatever he wanted. Well, the noble men in Rome didn't like it, and so they chased him off. And one of them, named Brutus, different Brutus, <coughs> named Brutus, swore there would never be another king in Rome. For 250 years, they'd had kings. In 509, they chase off Tarquinus, uh, Tarquinus Superbus, and they set up the, the um, democracy. They set up, it wasn't actually a democracy, it was called the Roman Republic. It was actually an oligarchy. They said, oh, you know, everybody has a say. No, only the wealthy men had a say. It was an oligarchy, but they called it the Roman Republic. It lasted for 500 years, from 509 B.C. to 27 B.C. So think, 250 years of kings, 500 years of the um, Roman Republic. And then we have a guy come along, Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was a wealthy young man with great ambition. He had enough money to hire his own army. He marched north with his army to prove what a great general he was, and he conquered Gaul, which was the area north of Italy, uh, the, the barbarians, the mostly German or Germanic barbarians. Well, he became so popular and so powerful that the Senate was afraid of him, and they ordered him to come back to, to Rome by himself to uh, report in. He knew if he went back that they were going to arrest him. So instead of coming back by himself, he comes across, he crosses back into Italy, what we know as Italy, with his army. The river that was the dividing point between what Rome controlled and the north was the river Ru Rubicon. Have you ever heard the expression, he crossed the Rubicon? That means there's no turning back. When Julius Caesar, Caesar crossed the Rubicon with his army, it meant, I am now in defiance of the Roman Senate, it's all or nothing. Well, Caesar marched into Rome, which has had a lot of problems, and he declared himself over the next little while as being the dictator for life. In um, 44 BC, a man named Brutus, remember that? This was the descendant of the Brutus who had sworn there would never be a king over Rome. The Romans were very big on their ancestry. You know, the traditions of their ancestors. Well, people started going to Brutus, who was a friend of Julius Caesar, and saying, your ancestor is the one who swore there would never be a king over Rome. Your friend Julius has just declared he's dictator for life. What are you going to do about it? And even though they were friends, Brutus felt the obligation to follow the family tradition and get rid of Julius Caesar. So he led the group of guys that stabbed Caesar on the Ides of March. Caesar dies. His lieutenant... His main military guy had been named Mark Antony. Mark Antony assumed he was now going to take over as the ruler. But to everyone's shock, when they read Caesar's will, he didn't make Mark Antony his heir. He selected a nephew that they didn't even think, who is this guy? 
whose name was Octavia. And he made him his heir. Well, Octavian, as, his, as the legal heir of Julius Caesar, could take his name. So he named himself Gaius Julius Caesar Octavius. Soldiers who were loyal to Julius Caesar all over the empire, even though Mark Antony had control of the armies, they all said, this is another Julius Caesar, we're going to follow him. And so you end up with a war between Octavius and Mark Antony. Mark Antony runs off to, to Egypt and hooks up with Cleopatra, who is the descendant of Ptolemy. And I, I'm not going to go into the details, but Octavius, um, who later became Augustus Caesar, Octavius was a brilliant PR guy. And he started this campaign of public relations. And one of the things he did, for instance, was to convince and get the Senate to vote that Cleopatra, the, the leader, the royal leader of Egypt, was an enemy of Rome. Well, when he got them to declare that Cleopatra was an enemy of Rome and a threat, Mark Antony had now become her consort, so Mark Antony was an enemy of Rome. Smart guy. A lousy general, but fortunately he had a good friend who was a good general, who won the battles and gave him all the credit. The Battle of Actium in uh, 31 BC, naval battle, Mark Antony's uh, forces are defeated. He goes back to, uh, to Egypt. He and Cleopatra both commit suicide. Octavian becomes the ruler. He gets the Senate to name him Augustus. Again, very smart politics. Augustus can either mean one who serves the gods or one who should be served. <coughs> it means both things. And so he can always say, oh, I'm Augustus. It means I serve the gods. But everybody else knew what it meant. And he became the first emperor, 27 BC. There were bad emperors. There were good emperors. Um, I'll come back to that in just a second because the only thing that kept Rome, you'll notice that there's a pretty hard line here. They didn't go any further uh, east than this. There was an empire called the Parthians. I'm not going to talk about them other than to say that they, after the Seleucid Empire, one of the generals of Alexander, once he faded from the scene, the Parthian Empire, which had been tiny, took over all of what used to be, almost all of what used to be the Persian Empire. They were very powerful, and the thing to remember about the Parthians, they were the thing that threatened Rome all the time. Rome was always afraid, the Parthians are coming, the Parthians are coming, especially in, the, in their far eastern regions. In 53 BC, they handed a Roman general, Marcus Licinius Cassius, the greatest defeat perhaps the Romans ever suffered. A 40,000-man army under the Roman general was defeated, and only 10,000 survived to crawl back you know, west. And after that time, the Romans left them alone. But that was perhaps the greatest defeat the Romans ever had. Um, one of the things that happened, Diocletian, the emperor in 293, they had gone through a terrible period of time. The third century, that is the 200s, was a period called the, the century of crisis. Because after uh, some pretty good emperors, they had a period of time in Rome, the Roman Empire, when they had all these generals out in the, in the Netherlands. And whenever an emperor died, these generals would all get their troops to declare them the new emperor, and they'd all march toward Rome and fight each other. It was just civil war the whole time. Nothing got done. There was a period of time where they had over, you know, like 27 emperors in 40 years. And so, terrible time. Finally, they have some good emperors. Diocletian comes along, and he's very smart, and he says, there's no way one person can rule this whole thing anymore. So he splits the empire in two, and he sets up, there are senior and junior emperors over both sides because one of the problems is how does succession happen who becomes emperor when the guy dies so he said eastern empire western empire in the east there's a senior empire called the caesar augustus and a lesser or rather called augustus and a lesser one called the caesar when augustus has served 10 years he'll turn it over to the caesar who becomes augustus and we elect a new guy for the, the other one it sounded like a good idea unfortunately people are a little more ambitious than that and so, by 324, you'll notice here, by the way, one of the guys was Constantius. He was one of the Caesars. Constantius had a very good general for a son named Constantine. 324, Constantine takes over the whole of the Roman Empire, makes it one again. When he makes it one again, um, he converts to Christianity. And so, for the first time, Christianity is legal. It's legal during his life. Every emperor after him except one, Julian, who was only emperor for three years in the 360s. Um, Julian is called Julian the Apostate. All the others were Christian. Julian the Apostate wanted it to go back to the Roman gods. Well, um, 
with the United Empire under Constantine, by 395, Constantine's been gone for 60 years, they decide we do need to split it in two, because, again, one person can't run this whole thing, even though Constantine did it, and they created a split between Eastern and Western Empire. And you'll notice these various regions are called dioceses. The head of those Roman dioceses were called vicars. Do you guys know those words? The church later picked up those same words. A diocese is an area, a vicar is the person who is in charge. Those were Roman terms originally. The, this is important because the Eastern Empire becomes the Byzantine Empire, which I'll talk about. The Western Empire ends up being conquered, or conquered, ends up being attacked by tribes of barbarians from all over. These barbarians, there were, as you see here, Angles, Saxons, Franks, Goths, Visigoths, Ostrogoths, Huns, Vandals. Everybody with a pair of boots and three friends decides to attack Rome. <laughs> Because Rome was the center of civilization, they thought. And the western part of, and you'll notice nothing's happening over here in the Eastern Roman Empire. It's all over here. By 500 AD, you've got the Roman Empire, which has come to be called the Byzantine Empire because Constantine moved the capital to the ancient city of Byzantium, renamed it New Rome, and then his followers started calling it Constantinople, and that stuck. But in the west, you've got Ostrogoths, Visigoths, Franks, Burgundians, Vandals, all kinds of bad guys who convert to Christianity. They become Christians over a period of time. But you have the Roman Empire here continues. Now, the question is always asked, when did the Roman Empire end? Guys, when did the Roman Empire end? Anybody? No history buffs? What's that? Okay, very good. Um, it's actually 476, but boy, you're close. Now, a lot of people have different opinions, historians. In 180, when Marcus Aurelius, the last good emperor before Diocletian died, there was a period of time in which they thought that it started to decline, and some people think it ended then. There are also, some people say 350 or 334, when Constantine turned it into Christianity. Some people say 410, when the Visigoths first sacked Rome. Some people say 455, when the Vandals almost destroyed Rome. Some say 476, when the last emperor was in Rome. The actual date where the Roman Empire ended was 1453, because the Eastern Roman Empire continued until the 15th century. Okay? All right, so the Roman Empire, when did it end? Most Westerners, most Americans, Canadians, most of us, have no real clue about the Byzantine Empire. We don't even think about it. The Byzantine Empire did not call themselves Byzantines. They called themselves Romans. They were the Roman Empire. Um, the person, the people that were probably the greatest of the Byzantine emperors, which come along in the, in the 6th century, are uh, Justinian and Theodora. Uh, have you all been to uh, Istanbul? I asked that question the other day. Who's been to Istanbul? You went to the High, Hagia Sophia, I hope. This is the Hagia Sophia. In the 500s, well, Justinian did a bunch of things. One of the things he did that was really important was he had the Roman law codified into one document. And that Roman the codification of the Roman law became the foundation for Western law from then on. So that was one of the most important things he did for history. But in addition to that, they rebuilt the city of Constantinople. They expanded the empire into areas that had been taken over by Vandals and Goths and you know various other folks. But he also built the Hagia Sophia. Now, from where you are, I mean, you may not be able to tell this, but those are people. Okay. Place is immense. Um, what's that? The place is immense. It is enormous. And this dome. Again, think about this being built in the 500s. <coughs> this was the largest church in the world until uh, a, a couple of European churches, especially St. Paul's, which is technically bigger. But you walk into this place, and the sense of, you know, you, know, you practically fall over backwards because of the sense of awe that you have. In fact, the story is that when, when Justinian had this built, he walked into this church and said, Solomon, I have outdone you. Thinking of Solomon's Temple, okay. Um, when when uh, Constantinople fell to the in the 1400s, 1453, to the Ottoman Turks, they turned it into a mosque. Well, when Ataturk comes along in the 1920s and decides he wants to westernize Turkey, he realizes that 
the Western powers he wants to be able to have good relations with are not going to be too keen on the fact that one of the most important lar and largest churches in the in Christian world were, was turned into a mosque. He had it turned into a museum. They've uncovered some of the uh, mosaics and paintings and things now. This is a mosaic of uh, Jesus Pantocrator that is in the Hagia Sophia. They still have, you'll see these medallions um, around, around it, the uh, Arabic calligraphy that were there when it was a mosque, but it's now a museum and is open. But um, the the Justinian and his wife Theodora, Theodora was 20 years younger than him. She had been a prostitute. He marries her, and it was the smartest thing he could have ever done, because she was one tough, smart lady. There were a couple of times in his rule when Justinian, the greatest of the Byzantine emperors, after, you know, after uh, Constantine, he was like ready to run for it. They had one, one event called the Nicka Riots where um, those of you who are football fans will appreciate this. And that day the big sport was uh, racing in the Hippodrome. Um, and they had sides, teams. They were called the, you know, the, the Blues and the Greens. Well, each of them had one of their major guys had been arrested for something. And they, both teams, went to Justinian and said, you need to release our guy because we're the favorite team. And Justinian said, no. Well, they got together and rioted. They burned most of Constantinople. You know, people were dying. And Justinian, called the Nicka Riots, um, Justinian wanted to run for it. And his wife, Theodora, grabbed him as he was getting ready to get on a boat and said, what kind of wimp are you? You may want to run for it, but I don't want to spend the rest of my life knowing that I was the, you know, the, the queen of the Roman Empire and that I ran away. So I'm going back. What are you going to do, wimp? And Justinian said, well, I guess I better go back too. And he called out the army, they suppressed the riot, and they, that ended up with a rebuilding of Constantinople because much of it had been burned. So Theodora deserves almost as much credit as Constantine does, or as uh, Justinian does. Very powerful Byzantine empire. This, by the way, is the outside of the Hagia Sophia. The outside doesn't look like that much in terms of beauty because they didn't care about the outside as much. Does that look like anything to you? I mean... How many mosques have you ever seen? Yeah. <laughs> this church was so awesome that when the Ottomans conquered it, every mosque, major mosque since then, has been modeled on this Christian church, the Hagia Sophia. Very significant. Um, Justinian, as I mentioned, expanded the empire. They had been limited to, to just you know these areas. Back, he he his military retook. Um, Italy, they retook southern Spain, North Africa, Egypt, the Middle East. So significant growth. Unfortunately, as often happened, when he died, his successors were not nearly as influential or powerful, and so most of it fell away again. But the Byzantine Empire continued the Roman Empire for a thousand years after the fall of Rome. When, the, when Western Europe, the Roman Empire of, of Western Europe, was controlled by barbarians and people forgot how to read. You know, nobody would hang around a town because that just made you a target for barbarian, you know, marauders. The East still had spectacular cities and culture and literature and art, and it continued for over a thousand years after the last Rome, or almost a thousand years after the last of the Western Roman emperors. And yet we know nothing about this, which is a real shame. Okay. Um, we could talk for a long time about the Byzantine Empire. At the end, or right about the time of the end of Justinian's reign, uh, you've seen this, this image before, Christianity, the Visigoths and the Franks had become Christianized. They had converted. And so at that point, this line is pretty much what the way the Roman Empire as Justinian had left it. But Christianity had grown significantly. I've talked already about Islam in 570, Muhammad is born. In 610, he begins to have visions of God that says that the polytheists were common. People have asked me, um, was, was Muhammad Christian or Jewish? He wasn't either. He lived in a culture which was polytheistic. They had multiple gods. And he, the vision he had was of one God. The sense he had was that the Jews and the Christians who had come before had it right, but that it had gotten corrupted because of their own failing. And so the Hebrew Bible and the, the Christian Bible both had gotten messed up. And so this was a corrective. This was a straightening out, he thought, according to the vision he had of God. And so in 622 is when 
Islam is said to have begun. That's when the Islamic calendar begins, because in 622, after being rejected in Mecca, he goes north with his followers, band of followers, to Medina, later on comes back, conquers Mecca, and during his lifetime, this orange area is the area that was under control of Islam during uh, Muhammad's lifetime. After him, the gold area was his, his successors, caliphs. Caliph is the uh, Arabic word for successor. The four wise caliphs, they're called, expanded the faith. Um, and then after that, the uh, Uyamid, the Uyamid movement or dynasty of Islam conquered all the way up almost into France, you know, almost all of Spain and Portugal, and all the way up to the edge of the, the uh, Asia Minor. Again, I've talked about a lot of that. There were a number of different groups that are were descendants of and uh, heirs to the Islamic Empire. Uh, and I, you got questions about that, we can talk about it. This is not Asia Minor, uh, or, or the ancient Near East, or the Middle East, or North Africa, or anything else. This is France and Germany. But it's important, particularly to give you a perspective about the Roman Empire. In um, the 700s, 732, Charles Martel, who was the leader, he wasn't actually king at that point, he was the leader of the Franks, this barbaric people that had converted to Christianity. Charles Martel in 732, defeated the Moorish army that had come all the way up in, into, um, well up into Tours in Poitiers in France, drove them back, they ended up going back to the border between what we know of as France and Spain. His son, another dynamic name, Pepin the Short. <laughs> Pepin the Short was very significant because he followed his father Charles Martel, but he is the one who donated to the Pope. He came down into what we know as Italy, he defeated the Lombards, which was a, a group of, again, barbarian peoples, and he gave most of the land that he conquered to the Pope. Those were the papal states. For a long time, the Pope was the ruler of a large tract of what we know of as Italy, the papal states, that was the grant of Pepin, it was called, Pepin the Short. Pepin's son was Charles, the grandson of Charles Martel, named Charles. He became Charles the Great, or we know him as Charlemagne. Charlemagne started in 768 AD. We could do a whole talk about Charlemagne. Apparently he was over like seven feet tall. You know, huge guy, powerful, smart. He um, introduced a renaissance, the Carolingian renaissance it's called, of art and learning, literature. Uh, he also conquered a lot of the rest of Europe and to be quite, quite frank, <laughs> so to speak, he was the king of Franks. He, um, t -t 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 -t, sorry. He forced a lot of peoples who were pagan before that to become Christian. And it was by force of arms, let's, let's be honest. But the thing was, because he defended the papacy. Now, Western Europe, the reason I mentioned this, Western Europe had been a mess. All these barbarian peoples who became Christian, but still there were barbarians, there were pagans, there was no real kingdom until Charlemagne tied it all together. In 800 A.D., Charlemagne after, comes, comes to Rome to defend the Pope against some, some enemies, and the Pope crowns him the Holy Roman Emperor. Why? In the East, they still had a Roman Empire. In the West, it was just all chopped up, and pagans and barbarians and, you know, and, and all kinds of folks. Well, the Pope thought... If I can make this guy my guy and name him the emperor in the West, maybe we can begin to get back to where the East is right now in terms of sophistication and everything else. And so the Roman, the Holy Roman Empire, which continued for a long time after Charlemagne but started with him, was an effort to regain the glory that still existed in Constantinople and in the, in the Byzantine Empire for another 600 years after Charlemagne, all right? 1054, as I told you the other day, Christianity splits in two. Along the same line, east and west, that had been created when they split the, the Roman Empire into east and west. In the east, they spoke Greek. In the west, they spoke Latin in the churches. They had some doctrinal differences, some theological differences. A lot of it had to do with the fact that the Pope in Rome thought he should be in charge of the whole uh, Christian church. The Patriarch of Constantinople thought, Const Constantinople's been the head, the lead city of the empire for a long time. I should be over the church. 
they finally split, and everybody was excommunicating everybody they could see. So it was a mess. A short time after 1054 is the start of the Crusades in 1096. This map of 1100 gives you an idea what the situation was like with for uh, Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. This was the Byzantine Empire in 1096 when, uh, 1095, when the emperor in Constantinople called for help. This purple part here, the light purple, is, is the part that they reconquered when the Crusades started. The first several years of the First Crusade conquered that part and gave it back to the Byzantine Empire. They also came down here and formed the, the Crusader States, which we talked about in our talk of, uh, about the Crusades. If you didn't see that, we'll have a videotape in a few weeks you can look at. And then this is the Seljuk Sultanate. I mentioned that the Roman Empire continued in the east. Everybody after that claimed to be the new Rome. The Sultan, this says the Seljuk Sultanate, it actually was the Sultanate of Rum, it's called. You'll look on maps and it will say the Sultanate of Rum. Rum was the Arabic version of Rome. They thought they were the new Rome. In Russia, which had become Christianized, they claimed that Moscow was the new uh, center of, it had been Rome, then Constantinople, and now Moscow. The name Tsar is the Russian word for Caesar. And they thought that Moscow was the new Rome, and that they were the new Roman Christian Empire in Russia. Uh, this was the influence. Now, another group that you probably don't know anything about, or very few people do, is the Mongol Empire. By land area, the Mongol Empire is the largest empire in the history of the world. Genghis Khan, who was the starter of the Mongol uh, Empire, is the... Uh, most voracious conqueror in history, more than the Persians, more than the Assyrians, more than Alexander the Great. And they spread from the Pacific Ocean all the way to Asia Minor, all the way into Eastern Europe. Um, the, th the reason you don't know more about them is they didn't care anything about building anything or leaving anything behind. In fact, the thing about the Mongols is their whole policy was kill everybody. I'm not kidding. They would come into a town and everybody died. It's estimated that uh, people talk about who's the greatest mass murderer in history. Adolf Hitler uh, horribly was responsible for the death between, uh, between 6 and 12 million people. Joseph Stalin killed 25 million people. Genghis Khan and his immediate descendants killed somewhere between 30 and 60 million people. They would come in take over a town, and whoever didn't get killed in the initial assault, they would take all the people out on a field, men, women, and children, and they would tell the soldiers, okay, you take ten, you take ten, you take ten, you take ten, and they would kill them all. Half the population of China was killed by the Mongols. Two-thirds of the population of the Iranian plateau was killed by Mongols. They killed far more people than the Black Plague. And, but they were extraordinary uh, military. You know, their army, there was 130,000 soldiers in Khan's army. And Genghis Khan means the universal ruler. And he accomplished that more than anybody before him or after. Um, the British Empire is the only one that came anywhere close in terms of the amount of property they, they controlled. And um, so they would come in, conquer these people, and they didn't build anything. They were brilliant strategists. They were the best horse people, horsemen probably ever. They were the first people ever to use gunpowder in battle. Now, they had gunpowder before. For instance, there were some fortresses that had stationary cannon, but they had cannon that they could take with them. And they used cannon and, and gunpowder in fighting moving battles, which is the first time ever. Quite extraordinary, but they didn't leave any buildings. They didn't leave anything that we can see, and so most people have no clue about them. Um, they also, this area, all right, recognize that. You know, that's the, the Mesopotamian um, plot area. They came through there, and all of that, by this time, was green because they had invented irrigation. The Egyptians had done even a better job with irrigation, but they didn't invent irrigation. The Mongols destroyed most of the irrigation. Some of those areas are now desert because the Mongols destroyed the irrigation systems, and they've never been replaced. Um, he was very efficient, but not very nice. Okay. Later on, the descendants of Genghis Khan, like um, the Kublai Khan. You've heard of Kublai Khan? The whole Marco Polo, you know, in the, in the Kublai Khan 
Kublai Khan was grandson of Genghis Khan, and he ruled as the emperor of China. So they continued for quite a long time. We then have the Ottoman Empire. Again, the, the Islamic Empire went through a number of different groups that were in charge of it. Finally, in Eastern Asia Minor, there was an, an, an emirate, he controlled, he was like a local ruler, who really decided that he needed bigger bridges, and he decided to, to, to rebel, and he took over Asia Minor, and kept going from there. His name was Osman, or Othman, depending upon which language you're reading it in, and that became the source of the Ottoman Empire. They conquered all of Asia Minor, the Middle East, Egypt, all of North Africa, and all of uh, Greece, etc. Again, we don't, we don't think about this, but the Muslim armies were right outside Vienna a bunch of times, and they would be beaten back by Western Europeans, and they would come back. They were right outside Vienna. They controlled all of Hungary, all of, uh, all of Greece, Bulgaria, all of the countries of Eastern Europe, and they were always threatening to come into Western Europe. In fact, the Protestant Reformation of the 1500s, the Holy Roman Emperor during the Protestant Reformation, uh, Charles um, the Fifth, Charles was Catholic, and he thought one of his main responsibilities was to maintain Catholicism and to, to suppress Protestantism as it started growing in Germany. Every time he got ready to campaign against the Protestants, the Muslims would be threatening Vienna or somewhere else on the edge of the Holy Roman Empire, and so he'd have to turn and go um, to the east and fight the Muslim armies and did not deal with the Protestant Reformation, which allowed it to, you know, to anchor itself and to grow, and before long it had become too well established for anybody to do anything about it. Okay? But the Ottoman Empire continued to grow, especially under Suleiman the first, Suleiman the Magnificent, he is called. Again, if you go to Istanbul, one of the, and, and a lot of people don't go to this, it's up on a hill, the, um, the Mosque of Suleiman was, I think, my, uh, after I, uh, the Hagia Sophia was my favorite building in, in Istanbul. A lot of people don't go there. Spectacular courtyard and minarets out front and the whole thing. Um, so we need to understand that they continue to be a threat to Western Europe. This is the Ottoman Empire in the 1600s, again, Vienna. All of Hungary, the Crimea, Bulgaria, Greece, Armenia, Georgia, uh, North Africa, all of this was part of the Ottoman Empire. And that lasted up until the end of the First, or the first World War. They had gotten, they called the Ottoman Empire the sick man, the sick old man of Europe because they were not, it was not being, it was not in good shape. So at, in 1914, it had been beaten back from Eastern Europe, had a little piece of Europe, but everything else was in Anatolia or Asia Minor and these areas. And so the Ottoman Empire continued the end of the Second World War. The Ottoman Empire was on the wrong side of that war, and they ended up carving up the Ottoman Empire amongst the Western powers, which is why the British have such a presence, you know, controlling oil fields in the Middle East for a long time. You know, British petroleum, okay, that's because when the, when the, the, the Germans and their allies, the Ottomans, lost the First World War, the winning allies in the First World War, carved up what had been the Ottoman Empire, and it, it ceased to be at that point. That's all I'm going to tell you. I didn't even go an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> questions about that? Okay, yes, Danny. Uh, I remember reading somewhere that the Hittites were in charge in Egypt for a while, right around the time that the mm. Jews were there. Well, the, the Hittites and the Egyptians were the two competing superpowers of that time. Right. And they kept sort of seesawing back and forth in terms of how much they controlled. I don't think they ever completely controlled Egypt, but they probably got into the, you know, into that, the area, um, the northern part of Egypt as part of the process, because they seesawed back and forth quite a bit. Right. Other questions? I know this is a lot. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Bob? your website and uh, before you leave. Okay. I'll put it back up. Don't try to watch this. It will, it will, or you'll die. Um, oh my God, I'm dying. Uh -oh. Yeah, it'll happen. Um, okay, that, that'll probably be good enough. Again, I don't expect you to remember this stuff. That's not your job. You're on vacation. But hopefully, if just a little bit connected in terms of these empires, that'll be helpful. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll be happy to talk with you about it.